This sermon series on the book of Exodus is in part because the Bible school lessons this week draw largely from the book of Exodus. And so we are trying to help our children perhaps learn some of the basic stories of our faith, which when we go to the Old Testament, begin really in earnest in the book of Exodus. We have the the stories of, of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis, but then we learn a lot about who this God is, the God of Israel, in the book of Exodus, in this great saving act when God rescues his people from the hand of Pharaoh. We join that story today in Exodus chapter 14. Uh, We're going to read parts of this chapter, and so just stick with me. We're going to read verses 10 through 18, and then we're going to skip ahead and read verses 29 through 31. Listen as I read. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen, The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And then in verse 29. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and a wall on their left. And that day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians... The people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We know as human beings we share lots of things in common. One of the things we may not talk about all that often, but but we all share, is that we are all afraid of something. Now, we may not all be afraid of the same things, but, but if, any of us, if all of us are honest, there is at least one or two things out there that scares us completely. Uh, some people uh, do go throughout their life trying to avoid their fears. A man named Fred Culbertson really has made a, a hobby of collecting fears. It's not that he tries to be afraid of all of these different things. He, he just likes figuring out the names to all these different fears. Some of you are like this. You, you could rattle off all of these strange names, different phobias. Uh, there's the common thanatophobia. The fear of death. I'm not asking for a show of hands today. Uh, There is aviatophobia, the fear of flying. Arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. There are strange ones like pelidophobia, the fear of bald people. (laughs) Looking around, church may not be the place for those kind of folks. There is geniophobia, the fear of chins. Uh, I don't know if you're scared of your own chin or not. Perhaps for Baptists, there's chorophobia, the fear of dancing. Maybe that's what got us in trouble. (laughs) When asked about his own fears, Mr. Culbertson really answered with with really a boring one. Honestly, I was expecting more from him. He said glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. That's such a common one. I, I expected something more unusual. Perhaps some of you this morning are already fighting your own case of homilophobia, the fear of sermons. That's the case. Don't worry, we'll get through this pretty quickly. Whether silly or significant, fear is a part of every human life, isn't it? It's just part of who we are. As strange as it may sound, fear is actually a gift from God. 
God gives us fear as a way of really uh, uh, there being a warning system within our bodies to to warn us of danger or to perhaps call us into life-saving action. Uh, We know that that we all need a a healthy level of fear of certain dangers. Uh, My father was an educator, but earlier in his life, he he helped pay some of the bills through lifeguarding so that when he was teaching my brother and I to swim, he taught us a healthy fear of the water. Not a fear that prevented us from swimming, but a but a fear that helped us recognize that water can be dangerous. And so we have to always be on guard. But we know like so many of God's good gifts, uh, the things that God meant for our good because of the fallen nature of this world and our our own brokenness, our own sinfulness, that that sometimes these gifts can become corrupted in such a way that they they cause us uh, to be kind of caught in bondage. And that can certainly be the case with our fears. Fear that once was meant to protect or mobilize us too often in our lives can cause paralysis. It prevents us from really seeing beyond what we perceive as our, our own impending doom. That's what all of those phobias are, right, are about, aren't they? they? They are fears that have run amok. This debilitating fear, which might be described as fear in overdrive, really I think is where the Israelites found themselves in our story today. And for good reason, we'll see. But the beginning of the story, if we we back up just a a chapter or two, uh, is the fact that the Israelites had had one of their best days ever. Uh, They were in bondage to Pharaoh, but but through all of the actions of God and Moses and all of the different miracles, that, that Pharaoh had given them permission to leave. And he hadn't just given them permission to leave, but the Egyptians were so ready to see them go that they were giving them their gold and jewelry on the way out. So here these former slaves are now running away from Egypt, their pockets filled with Egyptian gold. It was a very good day. And then, and there's always a then, isn't there? And then they came face to face with the Red Sea. Now, now, that might not mean, seem such a big deal to us with our suspension bridges across harbors, our channels under the ocean, uh, but for the Hebrews, the Red Sea was a very big deal. The Hebrews, especially the ancient uh, Hebrews, could really be described as having a case of thalassophobia, that is the fear of the sea. They were a land-loving people. We know there were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, but really they avoided as much as possible sailing on the Mediterranean. They were not a people who liked the open ocean. Uh, that The ocean was to them a place filled with sea monsters, of, of storms that could come and destroy uh, one's property and one's, take one's own life. It's no wonder that when we get to the book of Revelation, a, a vision of heaven uh, that's seen by this Hebrew writer, what contains no sea. When God gives this Hebrew, John, the, the, the writer, of this vision of glory to help him understand that it's a place of great peace. For him, it's a place where you don't have to get on a boat. That was the Hebrew people. And here they find themselves face to face with the Red Sea, which for them meant a dead end. They come to this and they think, well, there must be another way. And so they turn around to look for that other way. And and what did they see? Lo and behold, Pharaoh's army, the very Pharaoh who had given them permission to leave, has now changed his mind. And they are pressing down on them, every horse, man, and chariot. This was the mightiest army of their day, the most technologically advanced people of that era. And here they were uh, bearing down on this ragtag, worn-out group of Hebrews. The Hebrews must have stood dumbfounded and terrified between the sea on the one hand and the army on the other. They must have thought this is the end for us. They were, as we might say, between a rock and a hard place. Have you ever been there before? Not not between an army and an ocean, but that rock and a hard place. Maybe just before everything seemed terrific, right? And then, then the pain started. Then the phone call came. Then the bill came due. Then, then if that weren't enough, then happened all over again. Then the fight started. Uh, then the money ran out. Then the car broke down. And then you looked around, and there just didn't seem to be any way out. In those moments, what do we find ourselves doing? We find ourselves filling up with fear. The Israelites were definitely afraid in this story. And they responded how lots of us uh, respond when we find ourselves feeling trapped. They started to lash out 
at the very people that they loved. They lashed out at Moses. They lashed out at God. Look at verse 11 with me again. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us into the desert to die? We can get on to the, to the Hebrew people here. We can be very critical. But how many of us have said things like this to our loved ones when, when we feel trapped, when we are afraid? We give the most biting comments to the people that we know love us the most. Because when we are afraid, we lash out in fear. We, we act not out of faith, but out of fear and distress and anger. But Moses, Moses, God bless him. He responded with a calm assurance. Look at verses 13 and 14. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, will ne- you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. One of the good things to know about God is that God, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And God knows that we are a people prone to fear. This is why the most common commandment in the Bible, you've probably heard this before, is not to love your neighbor, it's not to worship God. The most common command in the scriptures over and over again is do not be afraid. In fact, we're only in the second book of the Bible here in the book of Exodus. And yet God has already had to say to people over and over again, do not be afraid. God said these words to Abraham to calm his fear of dying without an heir in Genesis 15.1. God said these words to Isaac when his own anxiety was really rising about whether or not he could stake a claim in the promised land there in Genesis 26. With these same words, do not be afraid, God had, had assured Jacob that a trip to Egypt would not derail the promise. God seems to be saying over and over again, Don't be afraid. Don't forget, I am who I am, as he said to Moses last week. And I am in control. This passage, he goes beyond simply saying, do not be afraid. It really goes on to say, don't panic. Don't do something rash. Stand still. Don't fight. Trust in me. These are amazing instructions, really. I don't know about you, but anytime we find ourselves in a place where we feel panicked, if someone just, you know, how's this work? You're you're kind of panicking or your spouse is kind of panicking, and someone just looks at you and says, why don't we calm down for a second? How many of you tend to respond positively to being told to calm down? Yeah, I'm just giving you, this is free marital advice. This is not in the script today. Don't say calm down. That doesn't work, Okay doesn't ever seem to calm anything down. But, but here God is calling them to, to calm down, to be still. We, we know this is hard advice to hear, but because when we're filled with fear, we want to run, we want to hide, we want to fight, we want to do anything but be still. And yet Moses is asking for something even more difficult than fighting. He's calling for the people to live by faith. Faith to see beyond the obvious. He, he, he says, look, I, we can all see the sea, we can see the ocean, we can all see Pharaoh and his army, but I am asking you to see something different, something you can only see with eyes of faith. I am asking you to see God's hand. We can't see it with our eyes, but God is here and he is ready to deliver us. And if you will be, just be still, if you will be patient in faith, What you see with your eyes, the Egyptians, after today, you will see them no more. It reminds me from an image in that movie, The Patriot. It's it's old now, and I don't know if it's held up over time. But So you may not have seen it or or may have forgotten it, but it's about the American Revolution, and it's pretty fictitious. And and yet it does draw from one real battle, the Battle of Cowpens. And in in the the movie, the ragtag militia of Americans is led by Mel Gibson. And and they have come face to face with the British Army led by General Cornwallis. And, and, and Cornwallis sees this as, as an opportunity to, to finally crush the Americans once and for all. The, the British far outnumber the Americans, so, so they call for a full assault. And, and as the, the cannons begin to fire, you know, one man loses a head, the ground begins to shake, and the Americans in the scene are looking around. Some of them want to run and hightail it out of there. Others are, are ready and anxious to fight. But do you remember the scene? There's Mel Gibson, the leader, calling his people to stay Stay. They had all this nervous energy and yet he stay, 
stay. Friends, sometimes it takes all the faith we have just to stay, just to be patient, just to wait on our leader to tell us when to go. And and in the movie, Mel Gibson finally, as as the British draw near, calls on his men to fire. They unleash their rounds of ammunition. And then as they begin to reload, uh, Mel Gibson's character uh, gives a surprising command. He calls them to retreat. And and they begin to flee over the hillside. And the British think that this is going to be the greatest route they've ever seen. And so they begin to run even faster. They begin to break rank as they they see their enemy's defeat right before them. But friends, what we see with our eyes is not always the complete picture of reality, is it? Because when they come over the crest of that hill, what they see are not a small American militia fleeing into the night, but the entire continental army ready to attack. A rout indeed. Friends, if we had been on the fields in Egypt that day, we would not have placed a bet on the Hebrews. Not if we were betting on what we could see with our eyes. Anyone there could see that they were beat. But Moses called on them again to look with eyes of faith. Faith, the writer of Hebrews would later tell us, is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. On that day, the unseen hand of the Lord routed the Egyptians and delivered his people from bondage. Not that that immediately took care of their fears. I've just, I've got news for you today. Sometimes preachers make it sound like if we just put faith in God, there will be nothing to be afraid of. But, you know, God's deliverance, I just want to warn you, always comes with its own set of risks. It isn't that God just snapped his finger and all of a sudden Pharaoh's army disappeared. No, God calls on Moses to do what? He calls him to stand there and to raise his arms and to hold his staff. And and what happens? The waters part. And not immediately. The scriptures tell us this happens on the last watch of the night, which means it's dark outside. And you have a people who are terrified of the ocean. And what is God calling them to do? walk through a hallway of water in the middle of the night. I don't know about you, but that's not exactly erasing all their fears. To step out in faith is not to have this pathway in which we will, which will require no courage of us. To walk in faith means that sometimes when God delivers us, what he does is not to deliver us from our troubles, but to deliver us right through them. And that calls on us to not just, it's not that we won't have fears, but it calls on us to lay aside our fears and to walk forward anyway because we trust that God will take care of us. This is why the prophet Isaiah would later say, thus says the Lord, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Friends, God's deliverance will come. But when it comes, it often comes as God beckons us through the troubles that we do not want to face. And yet if we will trust him along the way, he will deliver us. On this day in this story, one of the greatest victories the world has ever seen happened as the Hebrews lifted not a hand and yet watched as their God destroyed the Egyptians. These slaves who had wanted to go back to Egypt instead of face their fear found themselves so delivered by the hand of God that it changed their identity. Before this day, they they must have thought of themselves primarily as slaves, as people in bondage. But after this day, they thought primarily uh, primarily of themselves as a people who had been delivered. If you were to ask them, who are you? They would say, we are the redeemed of God. We are the saved. We are the chosen people. We are the ones whom God has rescued. So much so that throughout the rest of their history, whenever they found themselves in trouble, they would recount this day saying, God saved us before. God will save us again. So much so that that even many of their names begin to take on this fact that God was their salvation. One of them will learn by the end of this book, Joshua, it's a name that means God saves. Do you know what the name Joshua becomes in Aramaic? Jesus. Jesus is the name that reminds us we have a God who saves. 
Do you find yourself between a rock and a hard place today? Are you paralyzed by fear? A fear of failure? A a fear of getting old? A a fear of facing adulthood on your own? A a fear of, uh, of a world that seems to be coming apart at its seams? Perhaps as a church sometimes we find ourselves paralyzed by fear, fear of what it looks like to to minister into a a rapidly changing community, fear of what it means to, to, to reach out to a new generation of believers. Friends, everyone has fears, but God speaks to us even today, do not be afraid, I am the God who saves. Stand still sometimes, don't panic And you will see the deliverance of the Lord. God will deliver us. How do we know this? Because he already has. He's already saved us from sin. He's already saved us from separation from him. He's already saved us from from really the, the power of death so that we know one day we will walk through our greatest fear, the fear of death. And he will see us safely through. We can trust in God because he is a God who delivers. I join the words in the psalmist, and I hope you will too, every day of our lives. Some, some people trust in chariots, some in horses. We might add today some trust in money or popularity, some trust in Facebook likes, some trust in political campaigns, some trust in fancy advertising, but we, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Who is his name? His name is Jesus. He is the God who saves. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we are so grateful that you are a God who saves. Help us to be a people who trust in you. Lord, you know that we are a fearful people and and we have legitimate fears that we bring into this place today. Lord, it's not that the dangers don't exist. It's that you do. And we can put our trust in you to deliver us from all the things that we fear. So, Lord, help us today to be a people of courage, not because we have the ability to face all that, that, that challenges us, but, Lord, because we walk with you, the God who saves. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.